okay, let's take what is considered bro science. Let's take what people apply in practice. I mistakenly thought that you guys did a, uh, a research study on like the, the calf study, but I think you just reviewed okay. it. Is that yeah. accurate? Yeah, we just did a research review. Um, the research group was out of Brazil. Um, my my buddy Zhao was the head of author, Zhao Nunos. Okay. Um, yeah, really good research group out there. And essentially what you guys found was that different foot placement resulted in differentiated growth between different heads of the gastroc. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it was like a, a classic idea where, okay, let's take what is considered bro science. Let's take what people apply in practice um, and let's actually observe it over a eight to 10 week training protocol and then measure pre and post see what's going on. So yeah, they had the cool thing about this too, is actually within subject design. So you can't, you can't claim that genetics or, or nutritional intake impacted their findings. So one foot of each subject did a different placement. Mm -hmm. So some people had this neutral foot where they're doing single leg half raise this way. Um, one foot could have been internally rotated at the hip. So toes pointed in and then one toes pointed out. And what they found was the toes pointed in hit the lateral gastroc more and then the toes pointed out hit the medial gastroc more yeah. um, and let's let some more growth over x amount of weeks which again like that's been you know touted by the bros in the gym right. For, right. for quite a while um it's cool to see some research that um, points out you can bias different regions of different muscles and that's why Kasim loves that you know those kinds of findings being published he's really into um trying to optimize what head of what muscle is doing the majority of the work mm -hmm. by putting your body in, in X, X position, um, by yeah, setting it's kind up of amazing. This. They were able to find those differences in such a relatively short period of time, you know I mean? Yeah. How slow muscle growth is. Yeah. Again, it, depending on the subjects, population and stuff, but, um, yeah, we, we see it all the time, man. We see it all the time. I think something like, so I don't know if you know this about me, but I've done a number of these unilateral experiments. And so okay. I have exclusively trained my right calf for the last like two years now. Okay. And <laughs> it's made zero difference at all. My, okay. my left and right are the same size. Um, and so you could say like, well, why are you still doing it? I'm like, well, I don't know. Like I'll, at some point I'll be able to say, Hey, it's been 10 years. Like, you know, whatever yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not like it takes more work. Right. So, um, so that resulted in no difference. Uh, for a while, I was working on a one arm pull up and push up goal. And so just on my left side, because my left side is, is weaker and smaller. So I was like, let me if I can get it on that side. Great. I was doing that for about three months with probably about twice the volume. Um, and I did not find a difference in arm size there either. And then I did an experiment where I added four sets of leg press to my left leg. And that did result in a difference of well, about okay. a half an inch after, I don't know, six months or something like that. Yeah. And what that probably tells me though, is that I, you know, my belief is there's a sufficient level of volume. And then after that, it's just kind of junk volume, whatever you want to call it. You're not really getting that much. I think mm -hmm. I probably was doing enough upper body volume. Hence all of that extra left arm volume didn't add much. I was able to recover from it, but it didn't add much. Whereas mm -hmm. I probably was not doing enough lower body. So once I added that extra for the left thigh, that actually did result in increased growth and calves, yeah. you know, that's just its own thing. So, um, yeah. so to me, I mean, one, I just find that interesting, but two, I'm almost surprised that it's not more common in, I mean, in studies, it's somewhat common, but not in, it's not like every study is like this. Um, but even among individuals, like part of me would even think like, okay, if, if you're so curious as a population or, or as a person, what's better, low volume or high volume, you could yeah. just do your own experiment and then just train one side of the body one way, one side the other way, with the two issues being, one, you're going to have to do everything unilateral, and mm. two, obviously, over that time period, there's a systemic component, like people might argue you know, the overall recovery from high volume, and, and that's mm -hmm. going to muddy the waters a little bit. Mm -hmm. But from a purely just like a muscular standpoint, you could try it and then see, you know, especially if it's like 
your thighs where it's, it's not like the asymmetry is going to be so apparent to people or, you know, how many people are seeing your thighs. So yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. just a rambling thought there. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people self-experiment at all. Yeah. Um, at, at least in, in a fashion to that extent where they're going to do unilateral work right. and expose themselves to a different stimulus here and a different stimulus there that within subject design is perfect for a research study, but I just don't think people yeah. even want to risk like, Oh, what if I develop more asymmetry? Right. Right. Doing that. 